Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the T.W. Wood Gallery, and we're really very excited to have George Longnecker back for Poem City and uh, launching his new book as well. So I'm Ginny Callen. I'm the director here at the gallery. We've been here about three years open to the public. We used to be up on the hill at Vermont College for many years. And uh, Vermont College became Vermont College of Fine Arts and wanted to start exhibiting their student work. And so we had to look for a new home. So we bought this building with the Monteverde Music School and River Rock School. And it's become the Center for Arts and Learning. And we're really trying to have lots of broad arts and broader than that activities. So mm -hmm. um, if you haven't been here before, we're really glad you found us. Uh, the gallery does a lot of different things. We do summer art camps for kids. We're having an art excursion to the Clark Museum in early June for a Women in Paris exhibit. We um, have classes going on. There's a watercolor class coming up in a couple of weeks with Robert O'Brien, some paint and sip classes, flower design, a uh, number of different things, and there's a listing out in the hallway. So there's an email list if you want to get on our newsletter list. It comes out a couple of times a month, and we'll tell you all the great things that are happening here. We have an after-school arts program, uh, and have a number of little Montpelier kids come over every afternoon and do art activities. So mm -hmm. we're a small nonprofit. We survive by volunteers and membership and donations. So if you're not a member, think about doing that. There's information in the hall. I want to introduce Tom McCone, who's going to introduce George. And <laughs> most people, if you live around Montpelier, you know Tom, because he's been such a, a great uh, stimulus at the Kellogg Hubbard Library, doing so much for the community as well. So thank you, Tom. <laughs> Thank you, Ginny. Isn't this great? Standing room only for a poet? <laughs> well, as many of you know, George Longenecker lives a few miles from here in Middlesex. He was professor and chair of the Department of English, Humanities, and, and Social Sciences at Vermont Technical College. He is a longtime member of the Green Mountain Club. And you may think that's slightly off topic, but not at all, because you know, appreciation and love of the outdoors is a big part of George's life, and uh, it comes out in his poetry also. So uh, I've admired and appreciated George's poetry for a lot of years, and I have lots and lots of poems on single sheets of paper, and now have, a, have 62 of them bound together in one book, and that's really wonderful to have them in this durable form. So I'm going to read to you uh, passages that a couple of other poets have written about George. Uh, first is from Karen McCadden, and many of you know Karen, too. From domestic sweetness to the large-scale catastrophes these poems toggle between, from school drills against atomic bombs to visiting memorials to witnessing war in our time through the media, from a kitchen in Vermont to a bombed out kitchen in Syria. George Longenecker needles at sadness through beauty, catching the details of dailiness and of tragedies that can break and open our hearts. These love poems for the world, for his family, are wide open and his eye is keen. I love the resounding we in these poems, in love, steady, at home, as the world spins apart. These poems stare up at the universe and, and give us children who sleep all night in fossil seashells coiled in a bed of time. Birds fly in and out of these love poems too, arguing for sense amidst it all. And from poet Marge Percy. George Longenecker's Star Root is an excellent and moving collection. It's rare to find a poet who writes knowledgeably and in precise detail about nature, but also turns his craft to poems about married love, our constant wars, about death of children, of strangers, of friends, of our destruction of the planet and each other. Here is a poet with intelligence, craft, and heart. I love that line. Would you please welcome a poet of intelligence, craft, and heart, George Longenecker.
Star Route. She lived on the Star Route, Bliss Pond Road, her dented rural mailbox, one of two on the corner by a sugar maple. Let me kiss you, she said. I missed my turn and drove all the way to Libra. November stars flared between black branches. Somewhere between Bliss Pond and Orion, I turned and followed the right road home. Let me kiss you, she said, and I stayed longer. Some nights we still spread our wings and fly west, past Orion, wings tip to tip, Libra to Pisces, along the star route, up over the Pleiades. Blue stardust sparks in her eyes. Let me kiss you, she says. And we swoop so low over the pond that our feathers touch stars in the water. <laughs> Thank you, Ginny and the Wood Art Gallery. Thank you so much, uh, Tom and Rachel Seneschal at the library for all you do for Poem City. There's no other event like this in the United States that does so many events in, in one month as Poem City. And I'd like to thank Main Street Rag, my publisher, Scott Douglas, who helped turn out this book, is poet, editor, publisher, and he actually prints his own books. There aren't many people like that. <laughs> and, he, and he writes Harley Dave <laughs> and writes poems. About it. One thing I'm going to do in, in my workshop in a couple of weeks on the 20th is talk about poems of witness. It is how, how do we witness history and, and bear witness without being too didactic, too preachy and teachy? And I'm going to read some poems in which I try to do that. One takes place here in Montpelier. Bottles and Victoria's Secret. <laughs> Kim searches for five cent bottles and cans along the Winooski River, fills his sack, crosses the tracks to the Redemption Center. Lots more back there, he tells the clerk as she hands him a dollar seventy. It's a good day. Look what I found. Kim shows her a damp Victoria's Secret catalog bronze model and purple bra and panties on its cover. My daughter would like this. Her name's Victoria, too. But she left years ago with her mother. After Tim's Vietnam memories returned like a grenade to the head, he pockets the money, leaves with his sack and Victoria's secret. Behind the store, Tim sleeps near the river under a railroad bridge. New redemption, he says, when people ask him where he lives. His mind floats, driftwood on the Winooski. Kids walking home from school give him change and leftover lunch. One student wrote of Tim in a PTSD report. Pungent creosote stains the bridge. Trains hauling granite rattle the tracks. Above his bed, rats run on feather feet scurry by on their way to dumpsters. He sees Victoria with her alphabet blocks, TCDD, PTSD, 245T, CDEF. He hears bullets, smells defoliant, like oranges or old beer bottles, but it all blows away as red maple leaves and snowflakes drift onto his bed. Tim watches ice, bones, and bottles in the river. The Siege of Leningrad. How long does it take to destroy a city? They ate only bread, one piece each day. Now one candle burns for each day of despair and siege. In 1944, this was a ruin of stone and bones. Breath turned to frost as people stepped over frozen bodies in the gutter, eyes icy white. Each day of the siege, death and coarse bread. Below ground is the memorial where candles burn, bread under glass long ago turned to stone. 
only one piece each day? My daughter asks me. Outside is a fountain where visitors toss pennies and rubles into icy water. Some leave roses and carnations, which instantly freeze. How long ago was it? She asks. I can tell her how long ago, but can't explain bread hard as stone or children turned to ice and bone. Catacombs at Pechori. Deep in the catacombs of the Pechori Monastery, skulls of monks are piled to the ceilings, femurs stacked like firewood. Deep beneath the Russian soil, we move along narrow passageways lit by candles and torches. Shadows flicker in empty eye sockets. My daughter wants to know how long the monks have been dead. We find dates on teen tombs from the reigns of Elon and Ekaterina, but there are no dates of birth and death for the piles of skulls. But for them, time hardly matters. They were born, skulls pressing out of warm vaginas. They were born in the umbilical cut. My daughter cannot turn away from the bones, too close to birth to ignore death. It's winter in Russia, yet in the catacombs, it's warm with the sweet, fruity smell of soil and death. Above, sun shines on gold, Orthodox crosses that glitter on snow. We are gone and the catacombs are dark. We are born and the pile of skulls grows. Light flickers in skulls' eyes. And the next one's an ekphrastic poem, appropriate for an art museum. Ekphrastic poem is a poem about a work of art or a picture. Salt and Sorrow a kitchen in a residence in Aleppo, Syria, damaged Sunday in fighting. Narcisco Contreras photo, the New York Times. Walls are blackened. There's a refrigerator with rust at the bottom, stickers of yellow butterflies and blackbirds on its door. A dish towel hangs on the door handle, and atop sits a vase of purple paper flowers on shelves Shelves, jars of spices still stand upright. We can't see what's upright in the rest of the home, if its power is on, or if walls and windows are intact. Charred ceiling plaster covers the floor. No mortar shells or shrapnel, though. A jar of beans lies unbroken, and a tiny drawer, maybe for salt. We don't know, but nobody can live without salt or sorrow, no matter where. On a lower shelf rest three small pairs of sneakers. We can't see the children, their parents, or the photographer. They must all be somewhere, outside, but outside is not in the picture. We can't hear if there are explosions and artillery fire. On the wall hang pans, a strainer, and measuring spoons. Why do some things fall and not others? All the utensils are blackened, but we can't tell whether from cooking or just war. In a dish drainer, cups dry. They'll need to be washed again if the family returns. If they live, their blackened kitchen sent naked around the world. Mm -hmm. Purple Socks, another photo from Aleppo. A boy sits on a curb, crying and talking on his phone, shattered cement all around him, next to a body covered by a brown blanket, not large enough to be an adult. All we can see are the feet wearing purple socks. A child who awoke and dressed like it was an ordinary day, but there are no more ordinary days in Aleppo. Or maybe slept in clothes because they heard planes. After all, they live in a city that has ceased to exist. The parents, 
if they still alive, will bury their child, still wearing purple socks. So a diptych, which is the title of this poem, is, you know, probably know from art museums, it can be either a side-by-side -side pair of paintings, like that, or diptychs and or triptychs, or it can also be a type of memorial speech. Diptych. Early April at Yangtze on Hudson, I always forget how much I like the sun setting and reflecting orange on the river off Battery Park. I remember how much I like this restaurant. I hadn't known if it survived. Across West Street from this cafe, the sky glowed with burning jet fuel. I imagine they grip something in those final seconds, fingers curling, then incinerated. Their dust settled in this restaurant. I remember the times showed how the blast blew open windows of apartments upstairs. I sometimes forget how much I like my daughter's fingers, so intricate the way she uses her chopsticks. She flies back and forth from California often, but wasn't on one of those planes. People sometimes forget that this has not been the only place, Leningrad, or even the worst, Nagasaki, though it's hard to remember when you're in the place where ash and dust fell where bodies fell. I always forget how much I like the Sichuan shrimp here. Lights coming on across the Jersey side, the sun still dull orange in the river, fingers of late light between the buildings. Some people upstairs were still home to see orange fireballs. I see the pictures again and again, so orange and huge, hard to forget though sanity demand, demands we only remember so much. For some reason, I think of sweet-smelling oranges. Humanity demands we not forget too much, though it's hard to think too much about Gettysburg, fetid sweet smell of 10,000 rotting, joyous vultures and crows coming for miles. I've never really liked large cities but I always forget how much I like lights reflected in the Hudson and the sounds of tugboat horns. Only, other, only four other people in the Yangtze on Hudson. Still early, time enough to get uptown to the play. Sanity demands that we not remember in our every waking moment bodies falling through the sky or collapsing in pieces on battlefields. At Vicksburg, vultures circling optimistically hoping for another civil war or catastrophe. It was so warm that some windows upstairs were open that day. You forget how much force, how much dust blew in. Reality demands that we accept the dust and ash upstairs at Buchenwald, but sanity demands that we scream at diptychs of the dead. Sanity demands we forget Angola and Fallujah and here but humanity demands we remember. I remember that the subway station is still closed at Battery and we'll have to walk around the hole. We finish eating and pay. The ash and orange have almost vanished in the river. My daughter watches the water, chin resting on fingers. Only a faint reflection remains. I sometimes forget how quickly it fades. This fox walks into a poem. <laughs> Around the bar stand a wolf, a vulture, a crow, and two rabbits. On the Villanelle lounge, a boa constrictor, a couple of chinchillas, and three cats. What are you doing here, the crow asks. May I ask what you're doing here, Fox replies. Oh, we all symbolize something or other, says Boa. 
A raven sextet plays another rondeau redouble. Crow, causal, crow is along a little off key. Well, I gotta take a whiz, Wolf howls, and heads for the John door. He's lifting his leg to piss in the villanelle when Fox comes in. This place is one big metaphor. Tell me, Wolf <laughs> snaps, lowering his leg. I can't stand it. How come she put you in the poem, one of the cats asks Fox. Oh, she needed something to rhyme with locks or talks and keep her pentameter, I guess. Now the bow is hitting on one of the chinchillas, but she knows he's only after oral sex. Last stanza, bartender calls, closing in four lines. Fox ordered us another round, talks over the music as the Ravens play their last number. They all finish with tequila sestinas as the poet locks the back door. <laughs> So, <laughs> I said I was going to uh, read from a frotten, forgotten Vermont poet, Frances Frost. I found her in an anthology of literature that, that uh, UVM and Dartmouth put out in 1973. She's not related to Robert Frost, no relation <coughs> at all. She was a good poet, but she's not in the Vermont Anthology and the Anthology of American Poetry, the big ones, Rita Doves and, and the others. She's not an American war poetry, which is surprising. So I, I wanted to read a few of hers. And her book, Mid-Century, came out just after World War II, as did a number of poems. Mid-Century, Francis Frost. O chemic age, O century of sorrow, what shall the heart compel, the brain contrive, that will outwit the treacherous tomorrow? By what, what quicksilver strategy survive, the child, the dog, the red mercurial fox, the tottering big-eyed calf, the silver running of the frightened mouse? What chipmunk in the rocks will nibble dawn with cobwebs and with cunning? What shall we save in cities ruinous, of precious crucibles, of fiddles crying, when mortal meteors made luminous scream down the fiery plummet of their dying? Shall we, in the steel-pocked terror of our earth, devise some alchemy, some starry magic, whereby a child gone mad may yet give birth to a child less murderous and tragic? What shall we leave upon this hemisphere? What shape of hands, what maggot in belief, what war-crazed eyes, what agonies of fear, what name for God, O oh, century of grief? Mm. This one also by Francis Frost is First Snow. Out of the northwest, down the coast, the snow covers the sweet fern, lodges in bayberry, hushes the break of the hidden tide on the windward rocks. Here on the fractured cliff, the blackberry bushes are purple, hooped under whiteness, their berries forgotten by the tongues of the island children, the eaters of snow. Children, if down your coast, among your islands, fly the low gray birds, their cockpits stuttering death, be no more afraid than of the aiming gulls who cried toward their nesting rocks through your childhood evenings. Taste blood with no less delight than you taste new snow, and it's less cold and as brief as the melting flakes. And her next one is Time Out. <coughs> by night in hedge or hurried hole in roofless house by day, Beneath the plunging stars are flung in sand or rainy hay, wherever there lies down to sleep a fighting man, and grim, too tired for hate or grief, a child curls down to sleep in him. Francis Frost. to do some uh, poems of history and, and bearing witness tonight. 
and then done some memoir and then a couple of newer poems as well. I want to thank Cynthia, my wife Cynthia, who's a great editor. She has an eye for words, and she's inspired many of these poems. Fourth of July at Toscana. From our table by the window, we watch a constant procession of leashed poodles, collies, corgis, and mutts on Charles Street's cracked brick sidewalk. One collie wears a flag tucked into its star-studded collar. A fat man in baggy shorts wears a red, white, and blue USA top hat. Our waitress recites house specials like poetry. Vino nobile, corte alla flora, fungi, portobello, Minestrone di Vidura, Argosta. We sip our wine. Across the street, three starfish decorate the sash of third story apartment windows. Already there are crowds on Charles and Chestnut moving to the river for the concert and fireworks. A flag that once flew over Kandahar drapes the band shell on the esplanade where the Boston Pops will play stars and stripes forever. In the back bay, a gigantic flag hangs high on the old Hancock building. Its field of stars as big as the restaurant. While inside, away from the heat on brick and cobblestone, we enjoy our minestrone and our gosta. As we eat, three fighter jets roar over in formation. Soon fireworks brighter than stars will light Boston. A cannonade of thunder and fire, too much like real artillery, or like cannonballs over Boston Harbor in the Revolution. For all the noise, it's hard to believe in God or anything at all. The tables at Toscano are full, while outside grayness descends into human night, into humid night. All of us happy to at least have a holiday with good wine. <laughs> fourth of July. On the fourth of July, we climbed the ladder up the town water tower to a circular walkway a hundred feet above <clears throat> Reading. Streetlights flickered on below. Three sixteen year old boys on the edge of the night, where we climbed the ladder from the steel catwalk up the bulbous globe, gripping and ascending until we were 150 feet up. As twilight faded on the shore of Lake Quanapawa, we rested on the dome of the world, one hand clutching the ladder, the other gripping ourselves. Three boys atop a water tower on the 4th of July, waiting for the fireworks. We unzipped the sky. There was nothing between us and the stars as fireworks erupted into black sky and sparked and sputtered. Shivering, I shimmied down the ladder from the globe to the catwalk where I crouched against the cold railing and photographed the 4th of July finale with my 35 millimeter. The Kodachrome slides are all that's left. Their colors have dimmed but the fireworks still spark in the night. It wasn't only for stars and fireworks. We needed to climb that tower until we tasted death. I look up at that ladder now and wonder how we survived. 3K crazy 16-year-olds high on the night. Yet, I take my camera and climb that ladder again. For the night, the three of us were together, falling into sky erupting with fireworks and slowly drifting with the sparks down into Lake Quanapawa. Rambler. How many people here ever drove a Rambler? <laughs> Tell us the age of this group. <laughs> Rambler. We thought that car would go on forever. Our 59 Rambler American with three speed shift and overdrive on her steering column. A lime green turtle of a car purred across the Kansas prairie 
through Kiowa, south into Oklahoma, and all the way to Mexico, when Vietnam and Biafra were everywhere. On the radio, we heard body counts, famine, and carpet bombing. We thought maybe in Mexico we could leave it all behind. But how could we have thought that our rambler could go on forever? Everything American seemed wrong from Memphis to Chicago, from LA to Pleiku. But maybe in Mexico, maybe a little farther, and for a while with tires humming, humming on pavement, the ride was all we needed. You falling asleep next to me as we rode on into the dusty fire of a plain sunset. We were so sure that car would go on, but shouldn't we have seen how it would end? The rambler finally dying on a hill off Haight Street in San Francisco <laughs> while dead soldiers were still being shipped home. And so, so many highways later, you walking away down, in the down the road in Vermont. But that night, the Rambler American's flat six purred as it carried us south across the Oklahoma panhandle, just a little farther, and we leave Kansas, Biafra, and Vietnam behind for a while. And us riding and knowing that we and the Rambler and the flat plains must go on forever. <laughs> Ode to Gasoline. <laughs> I love you, but I hate you. You've always been so refined, and I like your aroma. Though you're killing me, I have fond memories of your high-octane brew. Forget about CO2, oil spills, gasoline. You and I have gone so many places. We crossed the Kansas Plains in my triumph. Black oil pumps rocked gently, sucked fossil fuel from bedrock, raw crude that took us all the way to California. You had pumps at every crossroads. I'd gas up and drive to escape city pollution, watch purple sunsets through dust and ozone haze, Janis Joplin singing, nothing left to lose. I loved the wilderness and hated you, but you took me everywhere. Now they blame it all, all on you, gasoline, who filled my Carmen Ghia, my Rambler, took us to Bryce, Zion, and Yosemite. I know you're dangerous, but my heart's an engine you've kept beating for so long. Tell me it can't be all your fault. Raw crude on beaches, melting glaciers, hurricane. I want to inhale your fumes, hit the gas, Go west like nothing matters except wind and a full gas tank. Wow. <laughs> it's nice having everything in a book. I haven't to shuffle papers. I will read you a couple of new ones at the end. 710. Across the street is a white church steeple whose clock long ago stopped at 7.10. On the corner beyond the yield sign is parked a baby blue 72 carbon gear. Sleet blows east as one of my students hurries in red-faced. Another folds her arms on the desk while outside yellow leaves still cling to branches. Sometimes I wish I were their age again and cling to the idea that if I could go back, something would yield. I'd love you better. We'd get up Saturday and not argue. Maybe we'd even listen to each other. We'd fly off in our Carmen Ghia, its whiny engine whirring. We'd stop somewhere at 710, stay in bed forever. We'd have time to do it all over again. Maybe do it right this time. Snow clings to gravestones in the cemetery. Across from the church, a few maple leaves fall. I swear the frozen clock has moved its hand. <laughs> so when I taught at Vermont Tech, I sometimes taught in my red schoolhouse. It used to be um, one of the Randolph Elementary schools. You know the play. And uh, just across the way is the, is the church clock. And sure enough, I, I wrote this 
I, I was doing the same exercise with my students. We came in the next day, and the clock, we, hands indeed were moving again. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it hurt my problems. <laughs> this one is dedicated to Sarah, my yoga teacher. Yoga class. <clears throat> Imagine Earth below us, she said. I think of a stone slab atop Mount Hunger, where I've napped in warm sun. <coughs> she says to look for balance in life. I think of stone balancing for eons. Then I think of hunger. Remember my dream, a hotel room I can't get out of, a dining room I can't find, student papers piling forever higher. But I want to think of birds, yellow throat warblers that balance on tiny branches. Branch out, she says. Then we chant Om. I hear warblers sing. Think inside your body, she says, as we breathe deeply. I think of my heart as electrical resistance. Hear Om. Feel it beating. Imagine myself a warbler, heartbeat five times faster. We move into tree pose. I balance. Feel my heart pump. Think of silly cliches, heartache, heart sick. I'm balancing on a pine branch, resting on warm stone. My heart beats so slowly and perfectly. I'm barely aware I'm here. <laughs> Poems of fish. Behind stones and brooks, resting in eddies, they pick through detritus, flowing down, leap to eat gadflies floating on the surface, make their own verse from beer cans, fishing line, used condoms, their own dead cherry blossoms. My father helps me clean the trout. My mother pan, pan fries it with butter and bed cr breadcrumbs. We light the fireplace, more for light than warmth. In the old lodge, bare wood floors and beams creak. A stuffed deer head watches from high on the wall. No past or future, just poems of trout who ignore syntax, live in present tense, flow on forever. My mother and father still with me, only today with our fish and fire. Besides being dedicated to Cynthia, this book is dedicated to my dear friend George Mathon, who died last year. He's a great poet. He collaborated on many of these poems with me. Book. I don't know where the poem lies. Last poem for George Mathon. Here we wrote so many poems, sawgrass blades click in the breeze, gather drops of morning mist, while herons wade the marsh, along with a few roseate spoonbills, wings slashed with red. But there will be no new poems today. On a beach nearby, dawn rises yellow in mist. Plovers make tracks in wet sand. We counted your last days like your mother counted days before birth. Slowly your words faded, lettered olive shells worn down by sea tides. I'll read a couple of new ones. This one was also inspired in part by George. Rain Taxi. Soft music down a windy street, worn smooth by light years of frustration and traffic, the fogs. Two red oak leaves stuck to the side window of an old checker cab, headlights reflected in dark puddles. The old Hancock Tower's light glowed red for rain, and from a higher building, a beacon revolved in the night. Horns of boats in the harbor, harbor echoed through streets, or water splashed up from gutters, ran down the sidewalks. There on a corner, I thought I saw you with your bag of poetry books and pens, first drafts. A stoplight glowed red in a puddle. 
And when my cab finally moved on, you were gone. Of course, I should have known it couldn't be you. We wouldn't write any more poems together. I'd seen you die on the first day of spring. I forgot where I was going in all this rain. I didn't know why the streets were so wet, why this cab was so old. I forgot what you had been writing about the last time we were together, the rain across rivers of streetlights. A new one. Coyotes howled. The minute we finished reading your poems, they started. First a few yaps from distant woods, then howls that rolled across the meadow and moved with coyotes across moonlight. You should have been here, except of course you're dead. Not deceased, departed, gone to heaven. Dead. You thought all animals should be wild. We'd argue about that and so many things in between revising poems while my cats brushed against your legs. The coyotes howled again as the moon rose. They must have been running in a pack. We couldn't have planned a better memorial for you who put so many animals in your poems, heron, alligator, osprey. But you're not here to write this one and how I miss arguing about words with you. Take my words. Take every line, break, stanza, and dash. Take a glass of red wine like we drink between poems. Take my poem. Take moonlight and coyotes' howls. Take off into meadow and forest and run wild tonight. And I'll read one more. It doesn't matter much on Jupiter. You wake me to see Jupiter, so bright, aligned with four more planets, Saturn, Mars, Venus, and Mercury. When the moon sets, those other worlds glow. All night, barred owls call back and forth from palms and pines. The breeze off the Everglades brushes our skin like moth wings carry scent of mud from mangrove swamps. So far to Jupiter, yet the planets tonight are as close as our bodies on this blanket, where we lie just three feet above sea level. Palm fronds tick in the wind. For a while, owls still call as clouds turn pink. It doesn't matter much on Jupiter that Earth's polar ice melts, that Florida slips under sea, Planets and stars fall to the horizon. A storm blows on Jupiter, older than all of our history. Love, I hope we can survive for one more night. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll take a few questions, but first the commercial. I do have books for sale back here. I know some of you uh, pre-bought books, so I'll, I'll be glad to sign those. I have books for sale. They're $14. I take U.S. cash, <laughs> cash from any other nation, as long as you know the exchange rate checks. Or if you came with no money or a check, don't be embarrassed. I have a way for you to take the book home, get my address, and send payment <laughs> later. So, any, any questions on the writing process or anything else? At least anything that's answerable in a poetry group? Which other poet is, or poets have most influenced you? Oh, uh, uh, a lot. I, I studied with uh, Palm Beach Poetry Festival with Charles Denor, who's now a poet laureate of Vermont. Um, Marge Piercy, whose class I took on in Wellfleet on Cape Cod, uh, was that four years ago? She she's been a huge supporter, actually. A couple of the words, like salt and the title Salt and Sorrow, came from her. Um, the late Thomas Lux, whose class I also took at, the, at Palm Beach. Uh, Karen McCadden, one Peter poet, a great poet. That'd be a whole hour long talk, Jay. <laughs> tell you all. 
How old were you when you started, George, writing poems? I, started, I started writing poetry when I was about 20, which was half a century ago. <laughs> and I really didn't do any more for years. I did around 200 radio commentaries for WNCS at a point, you know, and I taught comp lit. So about 17, 16 or 17 years ago, I started writing poetry again. And, you know, I knew how to write, but that doesn't necessarily mean you know how to write a poem. So I really need, and Susan Thomas is another person I should mention, mm -hmm. Marshfield and, and New York poet. I studied with her, and she really said to, to write poetry, you need to read poetry, and you need to read contemporary poetry, and that's true for any when you're writing a novel or writing, you've got to be aware of, of, of the literary community. So yeah, this, this is a project that's come together over about 16 years. George, you've been published in a lot of journals. Can you talk about the challenges relating to uh, getting your own book? Yes. Uh, to submit to journals, the ratio of uh, submission to acceptance is 50 to 1. So you have to send out a lot of stuff. <laughs> Any of you I see other poets here nodding. Yeah, you've got to send out a lot of stuff. And you know, nobody, this this editor, the editor of my book does a journal too. He doesn't make any money on that. Journals don't really don't earn money unless they get some good grant money. So I started submitting, I went to the Coleraine manuscript workshop to learn how to submit and how to revise. And I sent it out 25 or 30 times, then gave up, and then sent two more uh, submissions last year. And this one was an open submission, meaning it's not a contest. You don't have to pay. But bingo, I got it. And this was a quick turnaround. I, it was accepted in June, and here it is, done in March which is unusual. Turnaround is often two years. The other thing nice about this poem, but it's not really an answer to your question, but he lets you, the authors do their own covers. So that's my photo through mm -hmm. Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. <clears throat> other questions about submission or the writing process? What is your writing process? Um, inspiration. And, I need an idea. I keep lists of ideas. I keep a journal. So on one side of the journal, I have whatever I did that day. I, I, and I write in cursive. I think just the exercise of writing helps the brain. Then on often, not every day, but on the other page, I often jot down poem ideas or lines or take something I observed and write it out. And I have a bunch of to-do lists. Uh, when you were going to school, thinking back to first, second, third grade, yeah. did you have a hard time paying attention to I before E except after C when there was something going on out, outside the oh, window? I, I have a poem about that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't read that one tonight. I had a terrible time paying attention. I, I spent two years in fourth grade. I probably started school too young to begin with. I got the writing process down, but I just was, and I read a lot, but I, I was, yeah, you got it. I was totally unfocused. Just one follow-up question. Yeah. Uh, you did mention a friend of yours that you exchange ideas. And that thoughts. was George, yes. I never when you write a poem now, do you ever evaluate it and wonder how well, how well it's going to be received? Yes, all the time. Wonderful. Yeah, you can't be too preoccupied with that. But on the other hand, you need to know how the poem is going to read when you read it. That's refreshing. And you have to know if it's going to be confusing. There are two schools of poetry. There's the more abstract, what the hell did she say? And then <laughs> I, I tend to be more literal. You can't be too literal. But your reader needs to, if the poem has some kind of chronology, like where the rambler is going, they need to be able to figure that out. Other 
comments or questions? I'm going to sit over here and sign books. Ask me questions while I sign. So it sounds like these poems stretched over 15 years or more? Uh, yes, the oldest one, I think it's Jerusalem, is the oldest one in here, goes back 15 years. So how did you and your uh, publisher come upon the body of work that was going to go into this book? Um, you have to have the manuscript done. 90% ah. done when you send it to a publisher. They don't want to go through choosing the publisher. Mm -hmm. So that's important. And that's one thing I learned when I went to the Coleraine Manuscript Workshop was order of poem. So the poems, like the reading, I read a lot of them in the order they're in the book. They have to flow together, mm -hmm. even though they're separate poems. Mm -hmm. And once it's, it's, once it's accepted, the publisher realizes the book's OK, then you have some leeway to edit and add some new poems. And take stuff out, but not too much. You've got to send basically the same book you submit. Then once it, it's in what's called the galley proof, it's too late. Unless you really screwed up or he did. You're not you're not doing final edits or switching stuff around at that point. Or that editor will never take another one of your books. <laughs> Other questions or comments? I'm sorry, George. When you when you <clears throat> dwell on something, yeah, that's. Uh, do you ever get a pain in your gut? Yes. Yeah, when I dwell on a lot of things about the state of the country and the world <laughs> today. <laughs> I don't get nervous about doing this. I love doing this, but just thinking about uh, yeah, what's happening in the world. I don't think everybody gets that feeling. I don't know. I don't think so. Do you think everybody gets nervous about something, whether they literally feel pain or not? Thank you. Okay. Do you write poems to be heard or to be read? Both. Poetry really is like song. It should be read. So the idea of, of just reading it is, is more modern. So yeah, the poem should have a music. But you, as a poet, I also have to pay attention to the fact that most people are going to be reading them on the page. So it's got to make sense. You can't do all that other stuff, you know, voice emphasis on the page. It's got to work on the page, You've got to decide what the rhythm is, where the line breaks are, if it's going to be in pentameter. Is this um, book going to be available in electronic format on Amazon? No. <laughs> because well, of the way that some of the type is? Like no, he just doesn't. Ones. My publisher doesn't do it. Doesn't do that. He does, okay. He's a hands-on, he does real books. It's done hundreds of them. It is, I didn't, he doesn't use Amazon. I did put some on sale on Amazon myself. But he doesn't like, to, he doesn't like Amazon. George, thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you.